I'm Gwen McClure, and today on The Detail, the convoluted story of Auckland property company Duval and its directors, Kenyon and Charlotte Clark. A famous New Zealander once said that being a property developer would turn a nun into an axe murderer. I'm okay with that. billion dollar empire that's come crashing down. Auckland property developer Duval Group has been placed in statutory management. Initial investigations show high profile property developer Duval owes at least $250 million. The size and complexity of the business collapse, seeing the government step in to take control of the company. It was movie stars and swimming pools, diamonds and Ferraris, chopper rides and champagne lunches. My name is Kenyon Clark. I've been developing property now for close to 27 years. I've been incredibly privileged to work alongside my wife, Charlotte. At work, Kenyon is like a bull in a china store. (laughs) But it was all a house of cards, and now it's come tumbling down. It's been a bumpy few years for Auckland property developer Duval and the high-flying husband and wife team behind it. They've left a trail of despair, half a dozen unfinished properties around Auckland, and an unbelievable amount of debt. It's so bad, the government stepped in, a move it hasn't had to make in 14 years. There's so many different groups of people who've been affected here. There's the investors, uh, there's the subcontractors, there's a lot of tradespeople that are out of pocket over this. There's the homeowners who are wondering whether they're ever going to get their, their house, and it's just, it's just kind of shaken the faith, I think. Business Desk property editor Maria Slade untangles the story for us. We're going through a property downturn, and yes, we are seeing construction companies fail, but this thing has failed for reasons way beyond the economic cycle. And if you speak to some of the credit bureaus, they will tell you that Duval was on stop credit months and months and months ago. People knew that they weren't paying their bills. So this has been a long time in the making. So we'll start with what should be an easy question, but I don't think it is. What is Duval? Duval is a property development group, but one of the big features of them, which is important to all of this, is that they are also um, an investment um, group. So they were taking in money from effectively what turns out to be the general public to fund a lot of their developments. So that's where a lot of the trouble has come from. It's quite a mess of entities, right? I mean, there's... Duval Group, Duval, Duval Global, Duval Capital Partners. What is the division there? Are they all separate? Are they all the same? Well, they're all ultimately part of the same group. There's about 70 entities that the government's placed in statutory management, so that gives you some idea. They, every little thing they did, they set up a wee entity for, and to complicate matters further, uh, they were a bit unusual in that for each development, they set up what's known as a limited partnership. And for a limited partnership, you also need a general partner, and that is the actual company. For each development, should I say, there's at least two entities. And so it starts to add up when you're doing things that way. So that's not the way that it would normally be done? Well, developers quite often have one company for a development, and then they'll move on to the next thing. But yes, the way they did it was particularly opaque. Opaque is probably a key word here. So the directors are Kenyon and Charlotte Clark, their couple. So they're, in essence, the owners of this Yes, company. yes. I mean, there are, well, there are investors now that also own shares in the entities, and that, again, is another complicating factor. But in essence, yes, Charlotte and Kenyon Clark founded the group. So they're a married couple. Kenyon was a property developer previously. He and his mother, Jennifer Clark, did a lot of um, build-to-rent, effectively, products in, in Hamilton about sort of 20 years ago. And they actually both went bankrupt then. So it's not his first rodeo. And anyway, he came out of that and then started Duval and have gradually sort of built it up. So they have sort of a reputation for quite a, a flash lifestyle, right? Like Kenyon's website, his tagline is... Um, building a billion dollar empire, there's a Rolls Royce, there's choppers. Tell me a bit about this couple. 
They've always been pretty brash, to put to put it uh, mildly, and they made a reality TV series about themselves called The Property Developers. It's never actually aired. All the sort of general public has seen as a promo. So whether the episodes are sitting in a vault somewhere, who knows. But yes, they, they really put themselves out there. They were really big on social media, and they love to portray themselves as very wealthy property developers. I've made it very clear that our goal is to build a multi-billion dollar business and I want to give over a billion dollars away in my lifetime. I've experienced incredible poverty and incredible success, and I know which one I prefer. Let's just say that I think that we've basically just burned a million dollars. It was a facade, really, uh, but most of the homes that they portrayed themselves as living in were rented, and the, you know, the luxury vehicles, the Rolls Royce, all of that, it's all leased. So, yeah, it was definitely an image that they created around themselves. Which probably helped with their business to some degree, but it's sort of come well, back to bite them now. that plays back into what I said before about the fact that they were raising funds. They were exploiting a loophole in the law that allows you to raise money from experienced investors, experienced and wealthy investors. And so that means that they don't have to give the same disclosures and they're not regulated in the same way as any other kind of security. With a, with a regulated product, you've got to have a prospectus, it's got to be audited, you've got to be a licensed provider, all of that. This category of investments that they were offering, you don't have to do any of that. And the idea is that you're selling them to people who are very wealthy, very experienced, and they don't need all of that. They can make their own judgments about what the product, you know, the risks and merits of this product. But in actual fact, what ended up happening, you know, the, the FMA would say, the Financial Markets Authority would say that they ended up um, selling it to mums and dads, ordinary people, you know, someone who might have sold a house and had a chunk of money there or sold a farm or whatever, who were not experienced investors at all. And they were marketing these products initially very heavily on social media, or on Facebook and Instagram and so forth, which is not an appropriate channel for a serious investment product. And they were trumpeting very big returns, like 10%, which, you know, you know, that, that's a, anyone would look at that, particularly now, and go 10%. How on earth can you be offering that? How were they offering? I mean, I mean, it was a guaranteed 10%, wasn't it? Well, as it turned out, they weren't because they froze returns from the funds a couple of years ago and investors have seen nothing out of those funds. Well, I think one of the funds, there might have been a bit, but certainly the mortgage fund, uh, the returns have been frozen for about two years. And, and the investors haven't been able to get out their money either. They haven't been able to sell up those investments and, and retrieve their capital. They had three investment funds, actually. One was called the Mortgage Fund, one was called the Opportunities Fund, and one was called the Build to Rent Fund. So the idea was they were raising funds to support their developments uh, by getting you know mum and dad investors to put their money into them. But without saying they were getting mum and dad investors. No, that's right, because you, you're not actually allowed to do that. The whole idea of, of the law is that the people who you are inviting to invest in these kinds of things are experienced or wealthy. The one that really got the people who put their money into Duval was the eligible investor part of this exclusion in the law. And that means that you trot along to your financial advisor or your accountant or your lawyer and you get them to sign a certificate saying, oh yes, these people know what they're doing. But the FMA did a deep dive into this sector a couple of years ago and they found that they were literally writing things down like sold a farm. So, I mean, you could sell a farm and it could be worth $5 million, but that doesn't mean you're an experienced investor. And so these are the types of people they were capturing. And the FMA also had big concerns that they were saying to investors, oh, look, don't worry, we'll sort that out for you. Just trot down the hallway here. We've got a lawyer who can sign that for you. So that, that okay. part of it is yet to play out to find out to what extent that was actually happening. But that certainly was the FMA's concerns that this was what was going on. So they were hauling in a whole lot of people for whom this was a really inappropriate investment. If you understand that you're getting 10% returns and that there's huge risks with that kind of investment and you're willing to you know take that gamble, well, fine. But a lot of these people were not. The one, I think, was a school teacher and she'd sold a house, mm. you know. Wow. These kinds of people who, who've been captured by this. So that, that is not an appropriate investment product for that kind of person. And if it was advertised differently to that, is that still legal or well, okay? Well, that, that's where the FMA has come down on Duval quite hard. They tackled them over misleading or deceptive conduct. And that is one part of the law that they are regulated by. And so you can't just go out there and make all sorts of promises that you're not going to keep. So that is where the FMA warned 
Duval over it. And Duval actually challenged it and took them to court, saying that they had no right to make that um, order. Uh, they lost. And there was subsequent sort of argy-bargy over various uh, activities that Duval were doing with the FMA in the lead-up to, to this, um, you know, the receivership and then the statutory management. Uh, but yes, that is one part of the law where they are actually captured. And um, the thing is, they're not the only ones. This is the mm. thing. Duval might be the highest profile example, but there's a whole category of particularly property investments that would fall under the same sort of area, that they are unregulated wholesale offers. And the FMA had a lot of concerns that a whole industry effectively had sprung up around this loophole in the law where they were offering big returns and sucking people in on the basis of that. Uh, but, you know, the, the offers were a bit hollow. In October 2021, the FMA told Duval to remove advertising that was likely to mislead or deceive investors. Then, in March this year, the FMA gave the group a formal warning for misleading investors in their mortgage fund. I asked Maria if that's when things really started to fall apart. Well, I think the wheels had been coming off for quite some time. It was a bit of a, um, you know, keep feeding the beast. They had to sort of keep sucking in investments to keep turning over their developments. So I think that had been going on for quite a while below the surface. The FEMA did what it could, in my view. I mean, the FEMA gets a lot of criticism for not acting. But as Samantha Barris, the chief executive, said at the time when they did that report in October 2022, it's at the limits of our regulatory remit. They just, they just didn't have any powers to do anything much about it. Uh, so they did what they could to try and warn Duval to get them to pull their heads in and in fact warn some of the other offerers in the market who were offering similar products to just cool your heels and stop flogging you know, ads on Facebook to teachers and farmers kind of thing. Now the company's been put into interim receivership and they're under statutory management. What does that mean? Yeah, so there was a two-step process. So um, normally when you go into receivership, what happens is the bank or whoever's lent you the money, they say, right, well, you're not meeting the terms of your loan. We're going to call in the receivers. In this case, that's not what happened. The Financial Markets Authority, they have powers under the law where they can go to the court and say, look, we're really concerned about this outfit. There's concerns that assets may disappear offshore. We're concerned that you know there might be criminality kind of thing. Uh, we need to place them in interim receivership. And so that's what happened. So the interim receivership lasted for about three weeks. And then the FMA went to the government and to Commerce Minister Andrew Bailey and said, look, uh, we need to put this into statutory management. And statutory management's a tool that's really used. The last one was South Canterbury Finance. And so that was about 15 years ago, that, that group of companies. And the government went, yeah, OK, we can see that there's a big problem here. And it's quite a serious thing. They've got to go to the Governor General and get it signed off in order to put it in statutory management. It's a whole legal thing. But that's what they've done. And there's some people who've gone, oh, you've you've overstretched it here. You, you know, didn't need to go that far kind of thing. But the trouble is it's such a complex one. There's so many entities. And we've had the first statutory manager's report come out last week showing that there's at least $240 million owing. For a little South Auckland property developer, that, that's quite a lot of cash. Uh, and it could well be more. Uh, that's just based on their initial investigations into the company's own accounts. So statutory management basically means that they have brought in a third party, in this case PwC, to manage the company because the managers, Kenyon and Charlotte, yeah. are not doing it appropriately. Yes, that's right. It's, it's another bit of insolvency laws. PwC's role here is basically just to try to recover as much as possible for investors. Is that right? Yeah, I spoke to John Fisk the other day, actually, and he said they are conducting it in two phases, really. The first one is try and recover as much as they can for investors and, and um, secured creditors and unsecured creditors, too. So those are people like all your, your subbies, your, your builders and your plumbers and people like that that, that are right. owed money on the developments. And, um, yeah, so the secured creditors come first, so that's the lenders, the banks, whoever it was. And in this case, they were offshore lenders mostly. Uh, next in the queue, well, then you've got the, the tax man. The IRD is owed money. Um, employees are owed money. Uh, the, the, the unsecured creditors, the subbies are owed money. And the investors are kind of at the bottom of the heap, unfortunately. And then he says the next phase will be the investigation phase, looking into whether there was any criminality here or other laws broken and whether prosecutions need to be taken against anyone. 
So in the meantime, are Kenyan and Charlotte allowed to leave New Zealand or are they sort of... We understand they're not. We understand their passports have been Mm. seized as part of this. Yeah, the FMA raided the Clark's uh, home uh, on the first morning after they they got the order for the interim receivership, which again is pretty unusual. We don't know exactly what they took out of the home. Those bits of the report have been redacted, but we understand on the grapevine it was things like jewellery, watches and guns too. Uh, It seemed fairly evident because we saw the FMA going in with big gun-shaped canisters, so it would seem that is what they took. Um, I don't know how much you read into that. I mean, if there's guns in a home in that kind of situation, obviously they would want to retrieve them. But also they were trying to retrieve any assets that might be worth anything, Mm -hmm. uh, plus any records that could help them. So that happened on the first day. So it was all terribly dramatic, the FMA and their vests (laughs) going on in there. Uh, But yeah, that, that was right at the beginning. And so three weeks later, we got the statutory management and the, the, John Fisk said they're being as helpful as you might expect in the mm-hmm. circumstances. Mm-hmm. So the, okay. the statutory managers are talking to them. Not all the investors are very happy about the statutory management. Why is that? Yeah, so this is another example of how complex things got with Duval. So you had investors that put their money into these funds. So they were effectively buying units in a fund. So so it's a debt investment. They're, they're, they're lending Duval money. Mm-hmm. Duval decided that they were going to do a big restructure and they were going to uh, eventually list on the stock exchange. And so they created this entity called Duval Property Group and they persuaded quite a chunk of the investors to exchange their interest in the funds for shares in this newly created entity. And so there's about 60-odd investors that are actually shareholders now. Uh, They're not just investors per se, they are shareholders. And these are the people largely who... Uh, oppose the statutory management and say that the government's overreached its powers and that that they actually try and argue that Duval Property Group was solvent. Uh, But again, it depends who you're talking to. The statutory managers go, well, that's certainly not the view of things we've seen. The the whole argument about whether or not it's solvent is really interesting because Kenyon has said it's solvent. I believe Duval's accountant said it was solvent. The statutory managers are saying, no, it's not. That seems really black and white. Yes. Where's the grey area there? Yeah, well, that's right. You know, it is it is black and white. If you if your um, liabilities exceed your assets, then you are insolvent. And on the surface of it, that would seem to be the situation with Duval. But the thing is, you've got to get in there and you've got to get the records. You've got to see what the true picture is. And one of the things the uh, the PwC said in their first interim receivers report, because they were the interim receivers and then went on to be mm-hmm. the statutory managers. So they wrote the very first report and they said... The financial reporting was pretty loosey-goosey. That's my phrase, not theirs. John Fisk from PwC is one of the new managers who will now be dealing with Duval's 70 entities. When you lifted uh, up the hood here, this was a very complex web, was it, of, of companies and trusts and things? Yeah, yes, it, it was. It's a bit like looking at a plate of spaghetti, actually. When you've got a big group like that, you would do consolidated accounts that show you the picture across the whole group. That was never, ever done. Okay. So it's very difficult for them to work out exactly where things stood. And also there were a lot of related party transactions, money flowing between entities. And so then you've got to say to yourself, well, what was the purpose of those funds? Why was Entity A giving Entity B this loan? What was it for? What was the basis of it? Until you can see where the money's been flowing and what the basis of it was, it's pretty hard to work out exactly where the numbers fall. So that's where the discrepancy comes in. Are these investors... And creditors going to get their money back, or is that pretty unlikely? You'd have to say at this stage it's pretty unlikely. Like I say, they are actually at the bottom of the heap. And so you've got all these secured lenders who are first in the queue and, and, and the IRD. After that, you'd have to see, well, what's left? And there may not be much left. There were some kind of weird things along the way, too. Like in May of this year, Duval fired Duval Construction from one of their projects How do you fire your own company? I mean, how does that work? Yeah, that was an interesting one, actually. That was, I think, part of the restructure where they were trying to perhaps leave behind some of the debts and problems of other developments and put put everything into this one new entity, Duval Property Group, that they then were going to get investors to, you know, own shares in and then eventually list on the stock exchange. So I think they were just trying to leave. No one's exactly clear as to exactly what they were trying to do there, but it would seem they were trying to leave behind liabilities and okay. try and move forward with a new entity. What do we call this? I mean, there, there's 
all the issues we've talked about. And then there were some other things where, um, you know, they were paying the nanny and the house manager and the, the cleaner off of the company payroll, stuff like that. I mean, is this misappropriation of funds? Is it fraud? Is it a scam? What do you call this? What's happened? It could be it could be all of those things, for all we know. And that's the next phase that the statutory managers are going to move into once they've kind of figured out the accounts and, and who gets paid what. That will be the next thing, to look at where the laws were broken and the way the money flowed about um, and in the way, well, in, in the way the investors were sort of um, drawn into this as well, uh, the, in the way the investors were persuaded to exchange their investment for shares in this entity. There's a lot of sort of layers to that. We don't yet know exactly what kind of action the regulators might try and take over it. But at first blush, you would have to say there'd be pretty serious concerns that laws were broken. Other than the PwC process, what's next? I mean, are investors just going to sit and wait until they hear back? Yeah, investors are unfortunately in the position of sitting and waiting. We have to wait for the statutory management process to play out, and it could take quite a while. John Fisk said to me that it would could take about six months at least just to um, unwind everything and mm-hmm. figure out where the money's gone. So we could be in for a several years kind of process. The investors are not taking it lying down. There is one group of them in particular that have been very vocal. They have written to Commerce Minister Andrew Bailey providing a report saying that you know they think it should be out of statutory management and we understand they're, they're considering legal action. There was another group of investors who were considering legal action before this happened. They were a group that, about 15 or 16 of them, who had not exchanged their interests for shares and they were looking at potential liquidation or, or other action but the thing with the statutory management is it all everything gets frozen so there any other lenders or anyone else who was looking at liquidating dual entities they've just got a tie ho and, um, and and let the statutory managers do their job because they're in control now the projects that are ongoing where do they stand The um, statutory manager is trying to finish off a couple of the projects. There's one in particular called Mountain Vista Estate out of Mungaree. It's a huge big townhouse development and several stages of it had been completed. So they're pretty insistent that they're going to get that one done. There's another one called Earlsworth, which is sort of on the other side of Mungaree. And again, they they reckon they're going to get that finished. So because people have pre-bought these properties too. This is another set of people that are affected by this, people who had um, pre-bought houses. And so they're wondering, well, what's happened to my deposit and will I get my house? Do you have concerns then that this is a wider issue? I mean, you, you mentioned that earlier, but do you think there are other companies out there doing the same and we're going to just see a few more of these over the next couple of years? Yes. The loophole in the law remains intact uh, the wholesale and um, eligible investor loophole is still there for someone else to come along and start offering inappropriate products. I mean, things have died down a wee bit, uh, partly also because interest rates rose a bit and so there were sort of good offers in the banks, so people weren't quite so desperate to, to find high-returning investments. But still, uh, the framework exists and people argue that you need it because small businesses need a way to be able to raise funds without all the costs of going through all the regulation and, and all the rest of it. Um, but it's being used inappropriately. But the current government is hasn't noticed or is unwilling to notice this and just feels that, well, you know, buyer beware and th- we need this ability in the market. Other, other jurisdictions have similar regimes and if we didn't have one, then small businesses might go offshore to try and raise money. Uh, so we do need this provision. But the thing is, it's just not being used appropriately. Pretty tough. It's a cautionary tale, isn't it? It is a cautionary tale, and it is, as I say, quite a worry that this legislative framework remains in place. And, yeah, honestly, look, if I was seeing an ad popping up on Facebook offering me 10%, I'd, I'd run a mile. Because, A, why have you got to advertise on Facebook? B, why are you offering these sort of outsized returns? Because with outsized returns comes outsized risk. I guess they're always going to be floating around out there, but certainly it would be good if people could become a bit more educated about the fact that, you know, all that glitters isn't gold. That's all for today. The Detail is a newsroom production supported by RNZ and New Zealand On Air. Thank you to Maria Slade. This episode was engineered by Rangi Poek and produced by Alexia Russell, and I'm Gwen McClure. Mate wa.